Welcome everybody to uh, another running of PhotoCare's Bite Size Learning. Uh, it looks like we are still having a few people roll on into our webinar here. So I'm gonna just talk for a little bit before I get heavy into the introductions. But I wanted to uh, thank you all for coming today. I really appreciate you spending, choosing to spend some time with us. We are gonna be showcasing the Phase 1 XT camera today. And uh, I'm not going to talk too much about it. And apparently when I turn it sideways, half of it disappears thanks to my virtual background. Um, but this is the camera system we are talking about today. John will go into it a whole lot more uh, in depth shortly. But uh, it is an extremely interesting and unique tool in the marketplace. And it's um, quite a fun little camera to use. But let's, uh, let's, let's wait a few more moments uh, for a couple more people to sign in. Uh, as uh, you may or may not know, I'm Anthony Festa. I work at PhotoCare. I am our lead medium format uh, technical support person when it comes to phase one, Capture One. I also run our Capture One trainings. You may have seen some of the Capture One webinars that we've been hosting uh, since things went a little sideways with uh, what's going on in the world. Um, we have joining us today, John Gilbert from phase one. Uh, he is the head of US tech support. He is uh, immensely uh, knowledgeable on all of these subjects. Uh, so he's going to kind of take us through what the camera is and what it does. And, um, and we'll kind of, we'll, we'll, we're going to go through and, and, and handle all that stuff. I also have joining us today, uh, Manny Tejeda from PhotoCare. I believe we have some other folks, fine folks from phase one also in attendance today. I believe maybe Ziv Argov is here. I think uh, Francis Westfield is also here. Jeff Hirsch from PhotoCare is also in attendance. Uh, we have two sections for you to communicate with us. Uh, there is the, the Zoom webinar chat, if you are familiar with Zoom. Uh, that's where you can just kind of say hello, uh, any of that kind of interesting stuff. Manny will give you a little bit of information there, uh, drop in some links to where you can see um, the rest of our webinars and whatnot in our webinar schedule. Uh, there is also the Q&A section. We're gonna handle Q&A today uh, by waiting till the end to like actually answer, uh, ask and ask most of these questions, but please feel free to send them as we go. If there's something extremely relevant to what John's talking about at the exact moment, or something that kind of like hinges on being able to understand it, then we'll interject. Otherwise, we're gonna kind of keep the questions at the end to keep the presentation portion uh, rolling. So uh, again, welcome to everybody who signed in. Seems like we've leveled off right now. So I'm gonna turn this over to John and he's going to speak uh, about the, he's going to introduce and tell us a bit about the Phase One XT camera system. Take it away, John. Sounds great. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, yeah. So, as Anthony said, I'm John Gilbert, and I work in in tech support. I teach a lot of classes for Phase One, uh, including things like PSCP. Uh, but today, we want to talk about this new beauty here, the XT. Um, it's a camera that I've been super excited about uh, ever since it launched because for me, it, it solves a lot of the um, let's say the challenges and, and, and the problems that I've run into uh, for my own photography when I'm traveling. So it's, it's near and dear to my heart. And what I kind of want to do is I want to take a step back. I'm going to show you some slides because I, I think one of the most important things about understanding this camera uh, is to understand how we think about this camera, uh, what we designed it to do, what it's meant to be, uh, how, it, how it's different from other products um, that we've worked with. Uh, so let's kind of flip over. I'm going to share a little presentation here. So let's think first and foremost about uh, phase one. Uh, what do we do? Uh, what is our uh, goal uh, as a company? Uh, what is it that we try to do with our cameras? Uh, What's our number one priority whenever we make a product? Image quality. What's our number two priority? Image quality. Uh, what else do we do? Oh, we do image quality. Uh, are you sensing a trend here? Uh, is there anything else we do, Anthony? Ooh, um, yeah, there's a couple things. Let's, let's show them well, the next slide. I'm actually going to say workflow, <laughs> and, and, and you're going to start to see how this comes in because one of the things we, we think about with this camera is not only um, delivering maximum image quality, uh, but how do we actually work with it. Um, so getting back on the bandwagon, we also do 
image quality. And, and you're gonna hopefully see that this is, this is a, a, a trend throughout what we like wanna talk about here. So the next thing I wanna think about is, I wanna think about a couple different camera systems uh, because this serves as, as, as the basis for where the XT comes in uh, and how the XT fits in. So uh, phase one uh, has made modular cameras for a very long time. Uh, we started out as purely a digital back company. We were making the digital element that attached to everybody else's camera. Uh, a number of years ago, we be began to build our own cameras, uh, and that gave us a gr much greater level of integration. Uh, it also talks us a lot about what we can do with them. Uh, but today, uh, the same IQ4 back that we use with our XT uh, is the same IQ4 back that goes on to uh, the XF and can go on to third-party cameras as well. So again, the modularity is still there, uh, but the way the back is gonna work in those different scenarios changes a little bit. That's kind of what we wanna talk about here. So when we think about our bread and butter, uh, we think about the phase one XF, and the phase one XF uh, was always built to be a studio camera. It was built to be a professional photographer's camera. We can shoot portrait with it. We can shoot fashion with it. We can shoot product with it. Uh, we can take it out in the field and we can do architecture. And we can do on location work. And we can do landscape and we can do everything under the sun. It's built to be this dynamic camera uh, with built-in tools, built-in capabilities, uh, something that can go everywhere and do everything. Um, then we look at another camera, um, like these two technical cameras that are on screen here. And for those of you who are unfamiliar with the concept of a technical camera, um, a technical camera is very much the modern interpretation of a view camera or, or what you might have think of as a four by five or an eight by 10 uh, camera from the past. Uh, and, and the beauty of shooting with a view camera was that you have all these movements. If you move the rear standard up and down, you can uh, control perspective in your shots. Uh, if you tilt the, the, the front element, the lens, uh, forward or backward or side to side, you can control the, the plane of focus and the shape of your depth of field. And so you had maximum control over your image. But, you know, the downside of working with a four by five camera is you have to know what you're doing, right? And, and the same holds through with, with a modern technical camera. So the modern technical camera excuse the bellows for a helical mount, but we still have things like tilt on the lens. We still have things like movement on the back. So we can still control our, our depth of field, we can control our perspective, we can control everything else. But that same level of expertise that we needed for the four by five is still needed with the technical camera. So one of the reasons we see people use technical cameras is because they want the absolute best in image quality, uh, because they want the absolute best optics, uh, absolute lowest vibration, getting rid of the mirror, things like that. Um, and they want all of the control, right? If I'm shooting architecture, I want to be able to uh, move uh, the back around to uh, avoid things um, like keystoning in my shots. I wanna control my depth of field in a way so I can get uh, different parts of the image in focus and, and avoid focus on other parts of the image. Um, but again, I have to know what I'm doing. If I put, an XF in front of you, a regular XF. I can hand it to you, it's got a shutter button. It, it might be bigger than every other camera you've worked with before, but you fundamentally know how to use it. You know how to take a picture. Uh, with this uh, technical camera in the middle here, this Cambo, you can see we've got a little cable running between the lens and, and the back. That's where all of our communication comes. Uh, if you've never worked with one of these before, uh, not only do I have to sort of teach you about what it is, uh, but I probably have to teach you how to take a picture on it in the first place, right? Um, and, and that's the big challenge uh, when we look at a technical camera. Uh, if we step over to the, the, the little guy next to it, uh, that's an Alpha TC. It, it, it's essentially the smallest technical camera you can have, and it, it doesn't amount to a whole lot more than a frame holding a lens and holding a digital back. So we're pairing the best lens we can with the best digital back we can. Uh, we're not adding a lot of other bells and whistles into it, but it's a phenomenal travel camera. But again, the same sort of difficulty of making the image in the first place still exists because it's using the same shutter system as our technical camera, right? I have to teach you how to take a picture with it. So with that as a background, where we introduce the XT is here. 
we have that sort of look that we, we were accustomed to with that technical camera, but we don't have any of the extra cables. Uh, we don't have a lot of the, the, the extra stuff. So what we get with this is we get the very best optics, right? the very best lenses, the sharpest glass, uh, the best corner sharpness, uh, the lowest distortion, the very best sensor. We take our IQ4150, uh, we take it off of our XF, we put it onto our XT. We have the very, very best image module that we can possibly have. But we bring in the workflow you already know. If you've used a camera before, uh, you know how to work with this system. I press a shutter button, it takes a picture. I can set this up and, and I can have, um, you know, my parents come over and take a shot. And they've maybe never worked with medium format before, but they can take a picture with this camera. Um, and that's a lot of what we want to, what we want to do here. Uh, and lastly, um, we very purposefully gave it a travel friendly design. Could we have made this camera bigger and given it more features and more capabilities? Absolutely, but we didn't want to. We want it to fit in your bag uh, and we want it to be able to go anywhere with you. So another analogy I would use here, uh, in, in, again, thinking of how do we think about what, um, what the XT is. Um, this is a, a sort of a, a an illustration I, I got from our, our chief visionary officer, uh, Lau, uh, and he, he's one of the driving forces behind the XT. And, and I've got two knives here. One is a Leatherman Wave, and this is, this is a multi-tool that I've used for many, many years. It's, it's one of my favorite knives. I absolutely love it. Uh, it's, it's, I've had various of them in my kit for many years because somehow they keep getting stolen. Um, but, you know, it, it's a phenomenal knife. The blades are sharp. It's got every tool imaginable. Um, it's a lot like an XF, uh, phenomenal quality, uh, phenomenal capabilities, uh, and I can adapt it to just about any situation. Uh, the image next to it um, doesn't do all those things. This is a Japanese sushi knife. Instead of being made to do everything, it's made to do one thing. But I can tell you, which one would I rather cut uh, fish with? The Japanese sushi knife, right? I'm not gonna take it out. I'm not going to whittle on a stick with it. I'm not going to cut cardboard boxes open with it. I'm not gonna do all of that other stuff. Um, I might damage it. I would have to take special care of it. But when it comes to cutting fish, this knife is phenomenal. And, and, and it's a knife that you can appreciate just as much as the knife that does everything. So the same thing goes for the XF and the XT. The XF fills the uh, the need to shoot a variety of things. It's a professional workforce, workhorse, excuse me. Um, it goes where you need it to go and does what you need it to do. The XT is built to be the very best landscape camera that it can possibly be, right? The XF is modular. It has optimizations for the studio. Uh, it's highly remote controllable. Uh, we have autofocus, we have adaptable tools like focus stacking, pro photo control, um, time lapse modes. We have all of these things built into it to help you do a variety of jobs. I can put this camera on a coffee stand and simplify it. I can hand hold it out in the field. I can work with it on a tripod. I can manage it from the computer. I can shoot everything under the sun with this camera. But if I'm going to go backpacking, Right. If I'm going to uh, travel around an exotic city, do I want to carry the size and the weight of the XF? That's where the XT comes in. Right. Uh, it is designed very specifically as a landscape camera. Can it do more than that? Of course it can. But that was the goal of it. Right. So it's specifically designed not to do everything. Right. It's designed to give you the best lenses with the best back and allow you to take pictures in, in a very simple way. And the last thing, just to give you a little bit of an illustration here. Um, when I talk about this idea of being super travel friendly, uh, so these, these are two, uh, two shots. Uh, the one is that is actually me. Um, this is in, uh, 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 in Spain. Um, and this was actually on a family trip. Now, 
I, I say that for a very specific reason. Because it was a family trip, that meant I was not out taking a lot of pictures all the time, uh, except for you know a lot of pictures on my iPhone uh, of my daughter uh, going to interesting places. Um, but that doesn't mean that um, if we're going to go to somewhere um, pretty exciting, that I don't want to take really good pictures. Uh, and so there's there's sort of two main things that I want to point out about where the XT fits into this. Number one, I could put it in a, a a small camera insert that takes up half of my backpack. Right, I can have the camera, uh, I can have the back, uh, a few accessories. Uh, in this case, I actually would have traveled with fewer accessories and probably just an extra lens. Um, but again, it's only taking up half my backpack. It doesn't weigh a whole lot, so I can have it with me and I can carry it around and still get all the everyday vacation use out of the backpack that I need to. It's not my entire bag. This isn't even my biggest bag, right? And then when I'm using it, the other thing you should notice is that the, the tripod I have with me is actually not that big, right? Because this camera is lighter, um, because this camera is smaller, um, I can use a smaller, lighter tripod and still get all the stabilization I need. If I was going to put the XF on that tripod, I probably wouldn't be optimizing my image quality. But in this case, it was just the right size. So let's switch cameras. And let's take a little bit of a look around the XT and think a little bit about what it is. Uh, so I've got it set up here and I'm gonna be changing all sorts of different camera views. So just uh, bear with me on that. Um, but if we kind of look at it from the front, we've got our lens. Uh, this guy right down here uh, is the X shutter. Uh, and maybe we'll, we'll come back to that a little bit later when I, when I talk about the shutter system. Uh, but this is our integrated shutter. Uh, it's a replacement for the couple shutter. We'll talk a little bit about what that means um, in a little bit. Uh, but the rest of the things you've got here. Uh, number one, in terms of kind of some of the simplicity of this, uh, we do have a rotating mount built into it. So if I just flip open this lock here, the camera rotates right on its axis. So you can see the lens is staying right in the middle and the camera rotates around it. So we get this really nice seamless change from uh, landscape to portrait mode. Lock that back down. Uh, shutter button up here. Uh, we also have a, a lens locking mechanism uh, in the front. Uh, so we have two tabs that hold the lens in plus a safety tab in the middle. So the lens, even though I've unlocked it, is not going to fall out. When I want to take it off, I can take it off. And again, same thing, putting it back in, it clips into place, and now I'm just going to tighten it back down. In terms of lenses available for the XT currently, there are um, a 23 millimeter, which John has on the camera, a uh, 32 millimeter and a 70 millimeter, and FaZe has just released a roadmap of uh, upcoming lenses as well. Um, flipping around uh, to the back side, and let's just rotate this back so we can uh, get a view uh, of the digital back, and you should also see a view of the front side. So, one of the cool things about this is so the IQ4 is designed that it goes seamlessly from uh, the X app to the XT. And when we do that, the interface begins to change slightly. So now that I'm here on the XT, uh, right down at the bottom, I have these X and Y readouts. Um, and this is what's really interesting. So one of the, the, the sort of common things we think about with technical cameras is this ability to do shift. Uh, and the XT is designed to do shift. So here, as I move the back up and down on the camera, uh, that shift is being read out on the screen. So this is the, um, the first camera of its kind that's actually giving us this uh, digital readout, uh, this documentation um, of exactly what our movements are. And this will live in the raw files as metadata, so we can see it in Capture One, we can access it for later use, uh, we can use it if we're, we're utilizing um, uh, lens corrections automatically uh, in Capture One, so we can calculate fall off positions, it can calculate uh, any distortion mapping directly from the files without us having to input any uh, extra extra data. Now, 
in terms of how we utilize this, um, this camera, of course, has no viewfinder, but we do have a screen with live view, right? So if I come over to my shutter button and I give it a quick half press, we've instantly launched into live view and you can now see the uh, lovely interior of my dining room. So uh, if you were here with us last week, you probably got caught some glimpses of it. Well, here's some more. Um, once I'm in live view, uh, this is where we start thinking about how do we work with this camera? How do we utilize this camera? And the first thing I want to start out talking about live view, um, and this is something that you'll see whether we're using an XF or an XT, but it really begins to, to, to make a lot of sense when we're using this on the XT and when we're relying on live view. So within live view, if I swipe over from the side, I've got this little auto button. And when I have it in auto, it's the live view feed is simply going to adjust to give me a nice image, which uh, currently looks a little dark on my video feed, but that's just the little bit of the matter of dealing with video feeds. Um, but if I turn off auto, we're in a mode which is known as exposure preview. And so one of the things that we incorporated into the user interface uh, of the IQ4 when working on the XT is that all of our exposure details uh, are right here on the bottom. And if I press the bottom left button, that allows me to cycle through uh, the various uh, exposure items. And so right from here, we can change something like our exposure. And I'll use the uh, buttons on the right side to either make our exposure longer or make our exposure shorter. And what you see in the live view feed is the live view feed adjusts real time to reflect what that exposure is going to look like. So if I take a picture right now, the resulting image should basically match what we were looking at uh, while we were in live view. Now, if we continue on that path, um, what else are we doing from live view? Well, we're controlling focus, and this is a manual focus camera. Uh, so this is where, again, uh, we're going to rely on what we see, and we've got a few things to help you there. Uh, number one, you should see some flickering green in here. If I turn it off, it's our focus mask. So swiping again from the, the right side now, uh, I can turn on the focus mask, and that is going to highlight areas of the image that are in focus. So I can see the focus move from the rear of the image towards the front of the image. This also works uh, at 100%. So if we look at our XF camera, when it's lighting up the most in green, that's where I know that I've achieved my uh, maximum focus. So we can focus very easily. Uh, we can check our uh, exposure very easily. Um, but let's dive in a little bit deeper. Uh, what else do we want to think about? The XT is designed to be a camera that, that rewards uh, contemplative photography, really thinking about what you're shooting. It slows you down in a way that shooting with an autofocus camera doesn't slow you down because we have to think about focus, because we're really thinking about framing uh, when we bring this up. Um, so we start thinking about things like exposure. Uh, what's the best exposure we can get? Um, and ideally, what we want to do anytime that we're exposing, and this goes for every single camera, uh, we're going to talk about this, by the way, uh, quite a bit tomorrow uh, in the next webinar when we talk about things like frame averaging and dual exposure, because uh, a lot of the concepts that we talk about in relationship to frame averaging, dual exposure, come from this uh, idea that we would love to um, maximize the amount of light hitting the sensor. So if we can maximize the amount of light hitting the sensor, we get the best technical exposure possible. Now, what I'm gonna do on the XT is I'm gonna open up my live histograms. So tap the histogram button. And now I have uh, two histograms uh, and a clipping warning showing up uh, right here on the left side. The top histogram uh, that we label the RGB histogram, that represents the image as I see it on screen. 
And the thing you have to understand about the image that you see on screen, whether it's in live view or whether it is an image that you just took and you're looking at the preview and looking at the histogram for that, is this is a JPEG based histogram. It is looking at the pixels that appear on screen and giving you a readout for the pixels that appear on screen. But what it's not telling you is all of the image processing that went into making those. Uh, there's a gamma curve applied here. There's color balance things applied here. There's a lot of things happening that affect uh, the actual exposure. And they don't tell us anything about what this image is capable of. Uh, this raw file is going to have 15 stops of dynamic range, but I've got a screen which can probably only display 10 of them. Um, Capture One, in turn, has an amazing ability to recover highlights. So the question that I have to ask myself here is, well, are the areas of this image that are very bright, uh, are they too bright? Or could I go a little bit, bit brighter? So right now what I see is that the RGB histogram is just the history of what I see on, the, on my screen. The raw histogram really is telling me what the file is capable of. This is the data as it's coming off the sensor before it's been edited for display. So I can actually look at my raw histogram here and say, you know what? There's quite a lot of room at the top of it. Uh, so now I'm gonna look to my clipping warning and say, okay, well, the clipping warning is designed so that if nothing is clipping in the scene, it doesn't show up. Now, we've got a problem here, which is that under almost every setting, I get a clipping warning. Why do I get a clipping warning? Well, I've got six LED light bulbs in the frame. So what if I zoom in over here on this picture frame? Is anything clipping on this picture frame where it's super light even where I'm getting the reflection from the, from the window? No. At what point does this clip, right? Now I'm getting a few pixels clipping because we've got that really faint warning. No pixels clipping. And now we actually have meaningful pixels clipping. So as that clipping warning gets darker uh, and gets brighter, that tells us how many pixels we actually can't recover uh, when we get those files back. So again, if I start looking at other bright areas of the image, the back of this chair, for instance, no clipping warning there. Uh, the back wall where it's kind of bright, no clipping warning. Again, even though it's uh, bright white, you can see my RGB histogram is, is sort of all at, at 250, 255, but my raw histogram is okay. So in this case, I just have to account for the fact that my uh, lights are on and those light bulbs are always going to be clipping. So again, just kind of going over that really quickly. Uh, when I want to frame my shot, half press, live view comes up. I can capture from live view if I want, or I can capture from the main screen. Um, all of that works. Uh, we also continue to have access to all of our tools like frame averaging. Uh, we're gonna talk about this tomorrow, but frame averaging is, is basically a way of doing long exposures under any conditions. So we can go out in, in, in the middle of the day um, without neutral density filters and take as long of an exposure uh, as we want because uh, in this example here, uh, the digital back's gonna capture half second captures continuously for 20 minutes. It's gonna take 2,400 total captures and it's gonna produce one image based on all that data. Uh, but uh, it's a bit much for today's webinar, so we'll talk about that tomorrow. Coming back home, um, one of the things to really think about is what do we get from this integrated shutter system? So there's, there's a couple things. Because we have an integrated shutter system, uh, the shutter system is being controlled by the digital back. The IQ4 actually becomes the engine which controls and operates that shutter. That means we can begin to build in automated focus uh, or capture sequences. We can do things like bracketing. Uh, we can bracket with uh, this camera, which we can't normally do uh, in an automatic way with other technical cameras. Uh, we can do time lapse. Uh, we can control the number of frames that we want to do. 
the delay between them, and we can set it on a time lapse sequence. We also have drive modes, continuous drive mode, delayed drive mode, uh, or single capture mode. Now, when we think about the shutter system in this uh, camera, I'm going to go to the menu, to the XT menu, uh, and I want to look at shutter mode. Uh, my shutter mode right now, I was using electronic shutter. So electronic shutter is when we allow the sensor itself to scan. Uh, so in this mode, in electronic shutter mode, our lens is staying open the whole time. The aperture is stopped down. Uh, and light is just going through it, and the back actually works as sort of a really, really fast scanner. Um, the electronic shutter system in this can take us all the way up to uh, a four thousandth of a second, and then it can go as long as an hour. So we get uh, sort of the, the, the full breadth of shutter speeds that we're used to working with. Now, the problem with electronic shutters is that they, um, they don't mix with strobes. Uh, and things like motion can be a little bit dicey uh, because if you have a large object moving, uh, we get a rolling shutter effect with it. So if a car drives by, the car is going to look like it's leaning back or um, that's a, a, a common issue with electronic shutter. So it's great for landscape, it's great for architecture, it's great for product photography. Uh, it's not so great for people, it's not so great for moving objects. Um, that brings us to our other shutter mode and this was uh, and still is today one of the big challenges when working with technical cameras. Um, so most technical cameras are, are utilizing uh, what's known as a copal shutter. Uh, and this is a shutter which was effectively designed um, in the 1920s and has changed very little since then. Um, so it, it tells you something not only about their effectiveness that they've stood the test of time, but it also brings some interesting challenges which they are completely manually controlled. We have to reset it manually between every shot. Uh, the shutter speed is a dial on the shutter itself, uh, et cetera. Uh, the aperture is a little slide that you control. Um, when I put the XT in LS mode, leaf shutter mode, uh, it is now using the phase one X shutter, which is a, a shutter that we developed um, this past year uh, for the XT camera system, uh, but it's also gonna be coming to other camera systems as well uh, in the near future. When I put it into that mode, we're now using a proper uh, mechanical shutter in here. And because we have this proper mechanical uh, leaf shutter, we can now synchronize with strobes. If we want to synchronize with strobes, we can handle fast motion uh, and everything else. And so this shutter uh, will range us from a thousandth of a second and it will go down to um, uh, 30 seconds uh, of exposure. Uh, we don't hold it longer than that because th there's not a, uh, th there's not a significant reason to do it. And, and when we use the, the, X shutter at much longer shutter speeds like that. Uh, really what we're doing is we're just putting a lot more pressure on our batteries. Uh, and when we're using one battery from the IQ4, we, we'd like to conserve that as much as possible. So if you want to go longer than 30 seconds, use the electronic shutter. Uh, there's no need to use the power to hold the, uh, the mechanical shutter open. So let me show you kind of really quick here, um, just a little slide. Uh, related. To uh, our X shutter. Um, so again, the X shutter, uh, it's that sort of angled thing coming off the lens in, in, in that scenario. Uh, and the shutter that it replaces is, is shown beside there with the copal shutter. Um, the primary things that, that we improve upon uh, with the X shutter is that we have these carbon fiber blades. Uh, this shutter system is actually, um, it's a miniaturized version of the shutter that we developed for aerial photography. Uh, so when we started building cameras for aerial photography, what we began to uh, see there was that we needed a shutter system that could last for um, just ridiculous numbers of captures in a very unforgiving environment. Uh, so for there, we developed what was called the RS shutter, and this was a shutter that uh, we would warrant to 500,000 captures uh, in a vibrating aircraft uh, under the harshest of conditions. Um, so 500,000 captures warranty uh, in a lab, in a controlled environment, if I was to mount it on a camera like this, uh, we started looking at, at, at millions of captures in the lifespan. So uh, we miniaturized that shutter. Um, so it's carbon fiber blades, uses magnetic actuation. Uh, basically, we've given you a shutter which 
is not going to break. Um, it's it's a phenomenal, phenomenal um, shutter. Uh, the problem that we see with, with couple shutters, aside from the usability issues, um, aside from that everything is mechanically controlled when it opens, when it closes, everything else, is they're not made anymore. So uh, we, we found ourselves in this scenario with so many different uh, uh, technical cameras where um, people have to order uh, essentially shutterless lenses, lenses that have an aperture unit in them, uh, but no shutter. And now we rely solely on the electronic shutter of the digital back. And while that can be great, it can also be problematic if we want to shoot uh, large moving objects, if we want to work with strobes, um, that becomes a very uh, significant limitation. So uh, the X shutter gives us a solution to that problem. Uh, it's fully powered, fully controlled by the IQ4. Um, and, and what you don't see in this image um, and what we don't have uh, available just yet um, is what we think of as a third party version, which is we can control it from a cable. So we can run a cable between the digital back and the X shutter uh, and give you that capability for other scenarios. So stay tuned for that in the future. All right. Thanks, John. Is that is that about it you have for us on the extract uh, instruction on the XT today, or you have some more? Well, I want to show I want to show one more thing. Perfect. Um, and what I want to show is a very very brief look at uh, what in the world does. Um, Uh, does shift do for us? Excellent. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's that's kind of the pinnacle of this type of camera system. So, uh, really glad that this is the point we're going to touch on. If you haven't used shift in a camera before, um, this is it utilizes to some nice creative effect and the ability to make wider, bigger images, bigger, bigger prints, the whole deal. So what I what I what you should be seeing here, and let me get. Uh, and get us out of the frame because you guys don't need to see us again. Um, so what you should have now is uh, a view of live view uh, from Capture One, uh, as well as what I'm doing on the camera. And if I start to shift the camera up and down, you'll see that it's just like I'm sort of scanning around the existing image. We can go side to side as well. Get a view of my living room there. But I haven't moved the camera. And this becomes important because what this really allows us to do is we can maintain uh, all the lines that we have uh, in the image. So right now the camera is, uh, really it's, it's very uh, level. If I pull up my, uh, it's pretty close to level. Uh, so if I pull up my little pitch and roll sensor there, you can see we're, we're, we're quite close to level. That means that the lines here in my dining room are straight. Uh, the two doors uh, remain perpendicular, parallel to one another, uh, and everything looks as it is. Now, if I'm in a scenario where uh, I wanted to get more of the ceiling, right? Well, what happens when I tilt the camera back I've now changed that optical scenario and you can see I've now introduced keystoning. If we want to fix this keystoning uh, in software, I'm now going to cut into my image. I'm going to lose parts of the file. Uh, I'm going to get rid of all of that kind of stuff. So my goal is to keep the camera perpendicular to what I'm shooting. Keep it right on that flat level plane. And now when I want to get more the ceiling and include the top of my light fixture. I shift the digital back down uh, because we're moving opposite uh, because of optics uh, and things like that. And I can get that in the shot while maintaining all the, 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 the proper parallel lines um, that I want to keep. Um, the other use of that we can do uh, with the movements that are built in here is that maybe I need a wider image. So this is a 23 millimeter lens. It's extremely wide. Uh, that's something like a 17 millimeter for uh, uh, 35 millimeter terms. Um, but if I needed to get more to the side, 
Uh, this lens actually has a pretty small image circle. So you can see when I shift all the way over, we, we see the, the edge of the image circle. That's what that really black uh, area is. Uh, we can shift all the way over to the other side. Um, the 32 millimeter and the 70 millimeter lenses, they have much wider uh, image circles. So we won't get that sort of super, super uh, light fall off with them. Um, but this allows me to take a shot over here, uh, maybe a shot in the middle, and then a shot all the way on the other side and stitch those together. And because the lens hasn't moved, uh, the stitching becomes really, really, I don't want to call it easy, but it's, it's very, very easy. We, uh, we're much less error prone uh, when, when stitching those images together. And so we can get these really wide pano images uh, with tons of detail edge to edge and side to side. I just want to jump in and make mention that the stitching that you would do would need to be in a third party app like Photoshop or something like that yep. as capture one while it can handle the raw files. It can't take your raw files and put them together. So you have to do, you do have to convert those raws that you capture into say a TIFF, bring them into something like Photoshop and use the photo merge uh, tool there. And as John mentioned, it is a whole lot easier than kind of, um, taking say a DSLR and panning around, um, it, it lines up, it's so much faster. Uh, I've found when I do a stitch like John was talking about, I can often avoid that middle frame and just use the two frames from the left side, the two frames, one from the left, one from the right. And because there's enough overlap in the middle, it puts it together seamlessly. Um, but obviously with each lens and which each subject, you'll have to practice and, and, and work on this but uh, to see where you can get away with that. But it definitely makes it easier than having, because I've also tried panos with DSLR and it just is so much faster and smoother here with a technical camera, field camera. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so what, what, uh, what questions uh, do we have? Yeah, so if anybody has any questions, uh, please feel free. I welcome you to type them over in the Q&A section. The reason I asked to send the questions in Q&A and not chat is because we can actually mark them off as completed. So it looks like they're slowly starting to roll in now. So Tom Hayes asks, I noticed in your travel backpack setup, you separated the digital back from the body and lens. Would it be possible to travel with it all together, ready to go? Absolutely. Uh, I was just doing that for space utilization, uh, if you will. Um, so it, it depends on, on exactly what, what lenses and, and camera I'm carrying and what accessories, but um, yeah, you can absolutely leave it together uh, or you can take it apart, uh, whatever fits the best way in your bag uh, or matches how quickly you want to be uh, sort of utilizing it when you get out there. Yeah. And I mean, it's the kind of camera system, it does have, uh, uh, camera strap lugs on it. I actually put my peak strap on this one and was carrying it around. Um, you know, it's a slightly larger camera than, you know, maybe my mirrorless or my 35 millimeter DSLR, but you can still put it on a strap. You can still wear it and walk with it. Um, it may be not the fastest camera to photograph with, but you know, it will work also for street, especially with this 23 millimeter lens. Uh, it can be ready to go and, and just have at it and shoot. Yeah. I, and I think for me, what, what I like about it size wise and the reason, the real reason I wanted to show that image of it sort of just taking up half of my bag was that uh, there's been a number of times when I, when I've traveled either with this or, or, or before I had this uh, with the, uh, with the Alpha TC because um, I could have it in my bag. And if I didn't use it, I didn't regret carrying it around all day. If I brought a whole, and actually as, as, a, as a pretty great point here, um, about four years ago, I did a 20 mile hike up over a volcano in New Zealand uh, with my brother-in-law. And once you get used to medium format, it's kind of hard to go back. So I carried with me a, um, a phase one. I, I had a DF plus, uh, a digital back. And I think I even had three lenses because I wasn't satisfied with just one. That was a bad idea. Yeah. I forced myself to use it, but it was a bad idea. Uh, having this, which is just a little bit bigger than the digital back itself. Um, and this whole kit is about five pounds here that I would not have regretted. Right. Even if I didn't use it. Um, so 
that's what I really, really like about it. If I don't use it, it's okay. But when I want to have a, a shot, when I find something worth really taking a proper picture of, it's with me. So uh, Nicholas Dewars, uh, who you and I are both familiar with, John has a good mm -hmm. question. Uh, so I'm gonna have to let you answer this one. Uh, he says, hi guys, in addition to shifting, can the digital back also make swing tilt movements? And can you give us an example of where that would be beneficial? Yes, um, so this is where we, with the XT, uh, I mentioned earlier that we designed it specifically not to do everything, right? Um, so one of the things about our, our the, the mount that we've used for our dedicated XT lenses is that it doesn't have uh, a swing tilt mechanism built into it. However, um, that said, uh, the lens mount that we're using is the Cambo lens mount. And Cambo does make uh, a lens mount that has uh, tilt built into it. Uh, and those lenses can be used on an XT. Uh, currently, then we would either need to use the electronic shutter uh, in the digital back when working with them, uh, or if we wanted to use a, a, a copal shutter on that, we would run a cable uh, between the back uh, and the lens. So we can still use it on the XT, but we don't get the same level of uh, integration that the XT gives us. Um, so that's sort of the first part of it. Uh, what the tilt gives us is the tilt allows us to control the what I, I describe it as the shape of our depth of field. So normally we think of depth of field uh, being perpendicular to us uh, and running front to back in the image. When I begin to tilt the lens, I begin to change the shape of that depth of field. I can put it on an angle. I could, uh, if I can tilt far enough, I can make it almost go flat. So the ceiling would go out of focus and the floor would go out of focus, but everything between the camera and infinity would be perfectly sharp. So. Typically, the main uses of, of tilt is when we want to get uh, more depth of field on our objects at the expense of depth of field elsewhere uh, in the image. And so it's a, it's a phenomenal tool. It's, it's a brilliant thing for, uh, particularly for product photography, uh, for macro photography, for jewelry photography. Uh, there's a lot of uses that we can do in, in architecture if we need to get a uh, a small area of the scene much closer to the camera in focus as well as a, a certain part of the image farther back in focus. Um, the, the challenge of tilt uh, and why we didn't build it into uh, the XT uh, as it is, is, uh, well, there, there's really a, a few reasons, but the main reason is that uh, tilt is really, really great when you actually need it. But when you don't need it, um, it's something that you still have to think about in every shot. Is my lens back at zero? Because if it's not, your focus isn't going to be where you think it is. Uh, and it's not going to follow the normal patterns uh, that you think it is. So you have to start accounting for that on every shot. And so if we want to make a, a, a camera that is the sort of the simplest way to get the best image quality possible, tilt begins to run counter to that. So again, if you need it, there are ways to do it. Um, but I think we would also say that, that if, you, if you need it and use tilt a lot, um, the cameras that, that, are, that are best for you are the, the, the more sort of complex technical camera systems. If tilt camera is something that you are in need of, uh, we certainly have a couple of options and solutions that we can steer you in the right direction at PhotoCare. Uh, but we'll leave that where that is. Uh, let's look at some of these other questions. I've got one from Raf Rafael Puentes. Uh, I'll take this one, John. It says, for a beginner starting with this system, what is your advice? Well, my advice would be, um, if you are beginning with this system, uh, you should absolutely spend some time with your partner such as PhotoCare, uh, your partner or dealer, um, and they would be able to sit down with you throughout the purchase process uh, both beforehand and afterwards to make sure that you're comfortable with the system and understanding what the system is, how it works, explaining all the features and all of that to you uh, with a purchase such as this. Uh, that kind of thing and training uh, is something that we absolutely do uh, with all of our customers. Um, so that would be that one. Uh, we've got a couple questions from Andrea Brizzi. Uh, he said, did I understand correctly that a shutter release is coming? I shoot architecture and usually shoot with a shutter delay. Um, 
Is there a specialized shutter release for this one, John? Or does the regular Hanel work? I, the, I have one on the, the regular Hanel does indeed work. We can plug it directly into the digital back. Uh, we also have the, the phase one breakout box, which is sort of the, the supercharged uh, cable yeah. release that can also plug uh, right into the digital back. And so we can use that as a, as a cable release. Yeah, Andrea's um, question might, if I'm remembering correctly, he may be using other lenses on his XT yeah. body and then that's a different story. Uh, so, and then his other, Andrea's second question is, um, when will a Canon TSE lens adapter be available? Uh, well, uh, again, the, the beauty um, of this being uh, the, the Cambo lens mount is, is the Cambo, uh, in fact, has a Canon lens adapter, uh, and it works uh, brilliantly here. Um, and again, because the Canon doesn't have a, uh, um, a shutter in it, uh, we still have to use the electronic shutter anyway. Uh, on the digital back. Uh, so the only thing that, that we do is because again, because it's, it's a, a, a Cambo adapter, it doesn't uh, ultimately uh, complete a, a sort of a, what we think of as a as circuit between the two. Um, the back will just sort of act like it's on any technical camera, uh, meaning that the shutter button itself doesn't work, but you can uh, capture by clicking the little capture button on the back or using um, a remote cable um, or anything like that. Cool, thanks John. Um, Andrea, if you have any questions about that, uh, just send me an email and we can, we can, um, go back and forth on that a little bit if that's something we want to talk further on. Uh, so that was good. I think we have another question from Lane Sad. Um, when will they be releasing modifications for existing lens, uh, existing lenses to X shutter? Um, that, that I can't comment on directly. Um, because not, not only is it out of my control, but it's, um, sure. when it's ready, we will announce it. There we go. Yeah. I mean, that, that is a big question, uh, that we see a lot lane. Um, and unfortunately, you know, with everything going on in the world right now and manufacturing being behind and all of those situations, uh, if there had been a timetable, my guess is it's pushed back by a bit now. Uh, but absolutely, as soon as phase one has released that information, we will share that information as well. Uh, there are quite a few people that are looking to get lenses turned in to X shutters and have all of that happen. Um, so when that program's ready, we'll absolutely make sure that everybody is aware. All right. Uh, it looks like, well, we're, seems like we're caught up on questions. Did anybody else out there have anything else that they wanted to know about the XT? Any other questions about its setup and, and all that? All right, give me just two seconds. I'm sending something direct to somebody. Uh, John, you have anything else you want to share before we uh, do the outro here? No, I, I think that's, uh, that's about it. In fact, my, my IQ4 is telling me it's about to turn itself off anyway, <laughs> um, in case you heard some beeping there. Um, no, I, th I think that's about it from my side, um, but we'll be, we'll be ready to go tomorrow again. We're going to dig into uh, frame averaging and dual exposure, how they overlap, how they diverge from one another. Um, you know, if, if you've seen any sort of the official phase one um, uh, webinars and things like that on that, uh, you know, my goal in, in presenting it tomorrow is to give you just a bunch of examples and, and a bunch of sort of direct comparison points so you can kind of really see how how you might use one in, in some situations and another in, in other situations. Perfect. Thank you, John. Uh, I really appreciate that. Oh, looks like somebody sent the question in through the chat window. <laughs> uh, Frank wants to know what camera John's using for his podcast. Uh, John's probably got what, three cameras going over there right now? Um, technically four. Um, I, I'm, I'm happy to answer that. So I, I'm doing uh, primarily two things. Uh, number one, I, I've got a pair of uh, Logitech C220 uh, webcams. That's giving you the front view of, well, currently me, um, but the, the XT. Uh, and then the other thing that I'm doing is I'm using uh, what amounts to a, a video game streaming adapter from Elgato to convert the live view feed of a, uh, of a Canon uh, to do the digital back screen. And that's nice because it does live autofocus for me. 
and so I can move things around and it doesn't go away. Cool. Thank you, John. I appreciate you sharing that. Uh, I oh, hang on. We've got a couple other things. Look like we've got questions coming in through chat now. Instead, hang on. Okay. Nope. It's just some people saying thanks. Uh, I am just going to put this up really quick. Uh, this has got our next webinar, which John has alluded to a couple of times. Tomorrow is the benefits of frame averaging and dual exposure with the Phase One IQ4 150 camera system. Uh, it's going to be tomorrow at 2 p.m. Uh, for you to register. Uh, so feel free to come on, uh, come on through and spend some more time with us. We'll talk about those two tools uh, that come from Phase One Labs uh, specifically, which are unique to the IQ4 platform. They're really pretty incredible in what they do, uh, and they really utilize uh, the tech that this uh, camera system has built in uh, in new ways that we haven't seen before. So that's uh, pretty amazing. We also have a full lineup of other webinars, uh, demos, and uh, learning opportunities on our events page at photocare.com. So if you wanna see what else we've got coming up in I think the next two weeks worth of programming, we should have all of that uh, online and we're continuing to develop more of these as we go. So if you wanna see what we have, just continue to um, stay on top of that. And um, again, thank you so much for coming. We really uh, appreciate you spending some time with us today to learn a few things. Uh, we know it's weird out there. Uh, we know that there's a lot of hardships happening. So for you to take some time out of your day to spend it with us, we really appreciate it. So from everyone here at the PhotoCare team, as well as the phase one team, I want to say thank you so much. And I really hope to see you all tomorrow uh, for the benefits of frame averaging and, and, and dual exposure. Uh, thanks again to John, uh, my amazing co-host for making this happen. And uh, we'll see you all later. Sounds great. Thanks, guys. Thanks, John. Take care, everybody. Thank you.